Uh, South, the title of the webinar is South Korean Election Preview, U.S. Imperialism, Northeast Asian Security Crisis, and the Politics of Repression in South Korea. Uh, it will be South Korea this April, and it's an election whose result has the chance to put a break to this trend. Today's speaker, Dr. Hong Chan, is a renowned researcher and activist focusing on U.S. foreign policy on the Korean Peninsula and is currently serving on the board of directors of the Korea Policy Institute. She will talk about 20 to 25 minutes sharing her insights about the relationship between the current U.S. administration's new Cold War policy and the heightened regional tension in Northeast Asia, as well as the resurgence of autocracy in South Korea. We'll then hold an about 15 minute Q&A session uh, and end with an action plan for all of us. If you have a question, please feel free to write it in the chat box. Okay, without further ado, Dr. Chan. Thank you so much, Sunghee, and uh, thank you so much, Sunghee. Um, this is, uh, I believe, the third time that I am honored to be with our friends and comrades in Boston and New England area. In fact, um, I have lived there in Boston and taught there for about seven years, and I have such fondest memories. And uh, um, in fact, last week I was a little bit envious because of those people who live in Boston because as you, some of you might know, uh, the uh, world uh, famous Korean pianist, Yoon Chan Lim performed. So I was thinking I should have been there. Um, anyways, it's great to be uh, back. And uh, so today the talk, uh, the title of my talk is, um, let, me, uh, let me first share my screens. I have a, a PowerPoint slide, so let's... Um, is my screen shared? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, it, so it's the title of my talk is South Korea Election Preview: U.S. Imperialism and the Politics of Repression. And the agenda for today is uh, about um, six. That is. I'll first talk about key points on the April 10 National Assembly elections. And then I will review, I will lay out um, historical and geopolitical context titled as imperialism and resistance. Because often you will, uh, those who analyze uh, Korea, North Korea and uh, US-Korea relations often um, do it without any um, analysis of a historical geopolitical context. It's a huge issue, but I think it's very important. Third, I will talk about the Korean domestic political context titled as a Republic of Prosecutors, referring to the current Yoon suk yeol administration. And then I'll give more details on campaigning political parties and polls uh, related to the election and uh, comment on implications for the, our peace movement. And uh, the theme, my argument will be no sovereignty, no peace. And finally called for specific action that is it's urgent action that is needed right now, not tomorrow, not the day after tomorrow, next year, right now. There's gonna be largest uh, US ROK war games scheduled March and April. So that is the agenda that I have uh, for today. Now, let's first talk, look at the uh, legislative election. Uh, this, again, I want to emphasize the context. The context is that it, is, it will be held amid the largest U.S. ROK war games. Um, there are four points. Uh, South Korea has a presidential system, like the United States. Uh, it has two-party system, like the United States. Unlike the United States, it is unicameral national assembly. In other words, there is, uh, there is only one house as opposed to the United States that has the upper house and lower house, the Senate and the House of Representatives. And this election is going to be about the uh, 22nd National Assembly. So it means that we're going to elect 300 new members. 
Um, all of which uh, I can go into more about the electoral system, which as a political science, I love to uh, talk about it, but probably I don't want to bore with you too much. So 243 seats will be assigned, elected in a single member constituencies, which means it's just like the United States. Um, 57 seats, unlike the United States, will be assigned proportional representation through national party list. In other words, Korea has combined this, uh, the com uh, single member district and proportional representation, which makes which it a little bit different from the United States again. Um, the, the previous National Assembly election, that is the current, the uh, incumbent 21st National Assembly, is uh, right now it has the opposition centrist Democrat Party has the majority, 168 seats. In fact, it was uh, a super uh, majority. And the minority party is the ruling right-wing people power party. Kind of odd that they will name people power party. So, but don't be you know, confused. They're represented for people. They are not. Uh, they hold about 115 seats and remaining minor, uh, remaining seats are for, um, assigned for minority parties. It is forecasted to be tightly contest race. The opposition campaign to check President Yoon and the ruling party's anti-democratic coalition of prosecutors, oligopolistic jebels. Jebel means that in Korea, it's like, uh, the big corporations, five or six major corporations, and pro-US, Japan, war hawks. And it is also going to expect the new parties uh, are will strive for becoming the third largest party place in this system of a two-party system. And it will be a major political litmus test for President Yoon, who is now entering his third year of a fixed five-year term. Most importantly, Washington is uh, um, in favor of a conservative party, specifically to maintain the South Korea, Korea, US, and Japan war coalition against China. And in fact, just the last week, there was a report uh, says that about half of nuclear weak carriers will be headed to the Korean Peninsula ahead April 10 elections. It is just rumor. Uh, um, and if it happened, it will be the first time ever five US aircraft carriers to be deployed together since the Gulf War. And the first time ever in the waters around the Korean Peninsula. Again, this is not confirmed, but uh, there has been a report. Now, um, so this is the basic uh, key facts about the election itself, which I will look at more um, more in detail later. But before I do that, I want to talk about the uh, place this election within a historical context. Uh, it looks like uh, this is long genealogy from all the way from 1919 through 2024. I did it because to show you uh, patterns. The Korean Peninsula, the history of Korean Korea is about it's the relationship between imperialism, repression, and genealogy of resistance. Even the first one, 1919, when Korea was under brutal Japanese uh, imperial imp uh, colonization, Koreans led a peaceful, nonviolent, massive revolt, March 1st, nonviolent revolt. And then and you can, right, I would love to go into details, but for the sake of uh, saving time, I will just mention the patterns of this uh, amazing history. The constant variable is imperialism. Japanese imperialism, American neo-imperialism, American occupation. That is a constant, never changed. There is variation. There's in despite this very harsh condition, Koreans have always uh, uh, mounted, shown, displayed the vigorous resistance. In fact, I would say if you look at it, every 10 years there was a major, major people's resistance. So March uh, 1st, nonviolent revolt. And then if you can skip few, 1960, April 19th, student uprising against the US-backed autocratic regime. 1970, a Gentile uh, worker, right, textile worker, who self immolated to fight against authoritarianism, brutal military dictatorship that crushed workers. 1980, Guangzhou uprising, massacre by US-backed military junta. 
1987, June Democratic Uprising against authoritarian regime. 1997, IMF triggered financial crisis, neoliberal attack on workers and general strike. And most famously, the one that you, we are part of that history, amazing 2016 candlelight revolution, worker citizen led uh, revolt that led to the impeachment of Park Geun-hye. And 2017, now we had the liberal, that candlelight revolution made the regime change and elected liberal president Moon Jae-in. And we had the brief period of what we call the spring in the Korean Peninsula, which although uh, failed. And now uh, 2024, we are here. So what I'm, the reason why I'm pl place giving you this um, historical um, context is to look at, not only to look at um, what is the happening now and what is going to happen. The, my bottom line is, the situation in Korea right now in the Korean Peninsula, it is, it is the direst. It, it, is the, it is the most difficult period. It's more dismal. Many people are, uh, you know, many of us who have been watching, who have been involved in peace movement are uh, um, dejected, feel hopeless. But what I'm trying to also show, and despite all the bad news, as we looked at history of Korea, Korean resistance, now is the time to prepare because within next two years it's going to be crucial there's going to be as you can see another major 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 uprising and regime change and that's going to impact the relationship between the united states and uh, korea and the korean peninsula and into and, and relations between north and south korea sometime i would expect about 2020 five six seven so that's what i'm uh, that's why i'm, I'm giving you this uh, historical um context. How about geopolitical context? This is another issue that most analysts, uh, mainstream analysts, uh, um, do not point out. That is, has to do with United States imperial quest for nuclear superiority and global hegemony. Without understanding U.S. geopolitical uh, interests, we cannot have ad accurate analysis of Korea. What is it? U.S. regional hegemony through military empire that seeks unipolar hegemonic ambition, expanding the threat of war in Asia. And in fact, right now, so much so, the targeting against, right, ultimately, China, 60%, more than 60% of U.S. naval capacity have transferred to the Asia Pacific. And 400 out of 750 U.S. worldwide military bases and more than 130,000 troops are literally circling China as a part of anti-hegemonic coalition of US armed allies, what we call the, according to the Pentagon, force multipliers circling China. Thus, the greatest threat to peace and stability in Northeast Asia is not China, it's not North Korea, it is the United States in the Pacific military encirclement of uh, China. And this is the way, if you, the visual image will be like this. And in fact, I would just want to add that um, originally this forum was, I, I, I conceived of having this talk with uh, our, probably one of the best and brilliant uh, Korean American uh, analyst, KJ No. And uh, uh, the hope was at the time, the idea was that he would address this part of it, but um, probably we'll do later. So this is the part that uh, I was hoping uh, KJ to uh, address more geopolitical context. So uh, let me, so with, with this context, let's look at uh, the Korean domestic political uh, factor. That is the current incumbent president, Yoon sung yeon who is it? He's regarded as Washington's perfect partner. I'm quoting American mainstream media's uh, uh, portrayal of him. But in contrast, Yoon is the, one of the most unpopular president in Korea has in recent years. There's a widespread public discontent with Yoon's autocratic and repressive approach. It's incompetent, dogmatic approach, the deepening polarization and social, con social conflict, and he's aggressively pursuing neoliberal economic policies, privatization, massive deregulation, anti-work policies that only enrich rich oligopolistic corporations and serious democratic backsliding and repeated presidential vetoes. He's in fact becoming the king of vetoes of opposition-led bills causing gridlock. 
Most importantly, in contrast, while completely uh, repressing the domestic domestic agenda, he has been very loyal to strengthening uh, pursuing U.S. strategic interest. That is strengthening the new Japan-U.S. South Korea Cold Alliance. And in fact, Yoon Seung Yeol's uh, cabinet members are uh, surrounded by most hawkish groups. He basically resurrected those from the previous administrations, very disgraced conservative president. So much so, Yoon Seung Yeol, he imported six, seven times more U.S. weapons in the first year of administration than in the last five years of the Moon administration. So this is, you can see the uh, some details about the, where Yoon's priority is, that is to um, subserving United States. Hence, South Korea is a pawn in Washington's march toward against China. And Biden administration's unrelenting pressure on South Korea to join the US anti-China bloc. And uh, Yoon has been, Yoon has been um, engaging in a massive political crackdown, which you probably don't hear much from American mainstream media. He cracked down on his opponents. He's using national security laws, red baiting rhetoric to repress unions, activists working for peace and unification. And in fact, the most important aspect of that April 10 general election is the one that most mainstream media will, will not mention. That is this geopolitical contact that I'm just referring to. According to Noam Chomsky, U.S. is developing an attack on China right now. It is underway. And attack of war with China would mean pretty much the end of humanity, according to Chomsky. And KJ No mentioned, according to KJ No, U.S. is escalating to war in Asia. South Korea is a key element of this escalation. Again, I'm mentioning this because this is, will not be um, uh, highlighted in the mainstream media. Thus explains unprecedented large-scale non-stop uh, war games in, in the Korean Peninsula. In the meantime, corporate media intellectuals serving as state functionaries in this emerging new Cold War pretty much ignore their political context and Washington's support for political repression in South Korea. To give you more uh, detailed uh, background about the uh, war exercises, it is the world's largest offensive U.S. ROK joint military exercises. Now, the first one, Yun Sung Yeol's 450 days since inauguration. This is, we're talking about the entire uh, the period since his inauguration. 200 days of uh, joint war games, 80 times in total, unprecedented in number, scope, scale, and nature. If you look at 2023 alone, right, one year alone, the first six months, 120 days out of 1,230 days were game. From February 2nd to April 15th, almost every single day, not almost every single day for 40, for during that period, war games. U.S. strategic assets that carry nuclear weapons deployed to South Korea 18 times. So in other words, so I'm giving you this more, maybe a little bit too much detail to, to again highlight importance of the, uh, the threat of war that the United States is posing. In contrast, despite all you hear about North Korea threat, North Korea threat, North Korea threat, North Korea military exercises during the same period was about only 30 days in response to U.S. ROK provocative war games. Now, if you look at the, uh, those of you who are wondering what this data is from, I gave you this source. So um, also, I also wanted to look at more closely. Now, this is in Korean, so you will see, you might be wondering. So to give you, to uh, simplify, all this, uh, the part that is highlighted, right, is war games. Blue, the one that highlighted blue is only the North Korea's that were uh, military exercises, just like this. You can also see what North Korea, North Korea was responding to U.S. ROK working. And August to December 2023, so all these working, you can see, right? Pretty much nonstop war games, pretty much nonstop war games. How can the United States, 
right? How can the United States conduct such uh, nonstop um, war games at the doorstep of North Korea? Provocative, violate uh, 1953 armistice agreement because the United States has had continuous military outcome. In other words, US has the control of South Korean military. Opcon is usually considered as temporary transfer of military control during war, but the United States has never given up that Opcon. Right? It has so-called the peacetime Opcon, but Opcon, the most important jewel of Opcon is wartime Opcon. Right? So pretty much the United States maintains the complete, the de facto control of uh, 600,000 Korean troops, 3.1 million reservists, all South Korean military bases, weapons, material, etc. So in other words, and these combined forces and material are not part of defensive posture, but it is a U.S. imperial force and the threat protection platform. In other words, South Korea will be the front lines of any U.S.-led war in Asia. And South Korea provides, therefore, the most military manpower for the United States. It provides tremendous work capacity to the United States. In fact, South Korea's all those big corporations, travel, they all actually started as U.S. subcontractors during Vietnam War. And in fact, South Korea, the United States is preparing right now, have been, for South Korea to do, according to KJNO, to the heaviest lifting for military production and wartime logistics as a link in the military supply chain and also as part of Japan-U.S.-Korea alliance. And South Korea serves as defense industrial base on a permanent war time footing. And most importantly, South Korea is the closest U.S. base. It is ready right now. It's ready to go. Combat ready will serve as the earliest wave in any future U.S.-led war in Asia. Again, going back to again, why why can why can United how can United States does that? Because it has yet, uh, U.S. control of Opcon. Now, if you look at the US, US uh, history of Opcon, uh, again, just maybe a little bit too much detailed. And, but the main point of this slide is this. US ROK joint war exercise has been shifted from defensive now all the way to offensive, um, invading, preempting striking North Korea. And 2020, largest ever expansion of US, this is a 2022, it should be typo. So US RK war games are offensive and violate armistice, armistice agreement of 1953. And it is, as I mentioned earlier, US military bases closest to China for combat training, live fire drills. They did last year, live fire drill, combat training. So what they do is, you know, uh, the US forces in South Korea, what they do is that they, this is where it has global implications. This is where uh, they trained every six months or a year, and then they move to other regions because this is where you, in the Korean Peninsula, you can have a live fire drill, combat training. Thus, making us, wonder, right, what is the importance of, uh, when I say sovereignty, what do you mean by sovereignty? South Korea is a sovereign country. I keep saying South Korea is not, does not have sovereignty, it's not, has, does not have enjoy full sovereignty because it does not have the control of its military. Now, suppose once we gain, we gain sovereignty, what's going to happen? Most likely, it will help de-escalate tensions with North Korea. Why? Because South Korea can, inter-Korean uh, uh, military cooperation, might be able to right, de-escalate and make a choice, in fact, even not to participate in US-led war games. So here's, I read the op-ed that I had was how it's, uh, Yun sung yeols the policy, US backing of a far-right leader is not good for the South Korea, it's good for the United States. Now, how does Yun sung yeol does that? So how does Yun sung yeol uh, completely um, uh, subordinated to United States. It is through this uh, called the prosecutor uh, dictatorship, I would say dictatorship prosecutors. He was, uh, before he became president, he was a, a chief public prosecutor, right? We can go, you know, look at how he rose to power, but that could be another session. Now, the main point is this, um, he has 
as you can see that how he's the, Yun Seung Yeol's uh, presence led to the uh, democratic erosions in South Korea, as reported in New Yorker, and uh, a massive uh, attack, repression against the workers and peace activists. Now, going specifically on, so what is it? Probably you might have not heard about this new variant of authoritarian regime. It's called the Republic of Prosecutors. Most of all, the, the president's office is now staffed by Yun Seung Yeol's uh, cronist prosecutors. So there's a pros prosecutor's a president, chair of the ruling parties of prosecutors, cabinet members, important cabinet members, prosecutors, former prosecutors, major high ranking public offices, government corporations, chief regulator of mass media to control media, also from prosecutors, patronage system based on Yun loyalist. In other words, what it, and also the most important thing about this one, now they, they occupy presidents, the cabinet members, government uh, corporations. Now they're targeting National Assembly. So a critical mass of UN's prosecutors are running right now this election for National Assembly. Thus, breakdown of separation of powers, checks and balances, and independence of a criminal, criminal justice system, which drifting towards fascism feared in 1954. So their Korean prosecutors are most powerful political interest groups. In fact, when I said 1954, the 1954 law granted prosecutors the most powerful position. South Korean prosecutors, unlike the United States, have both investigative and indictment power. So whoever's against you, they can go out. They can, if, even if you, are, you, you, you did not commit any crimes, they can find something to indict. Right? That's what's going on. And in fact, uh, so this has been the, uh, the most, right now, the, the most powerful political interest groups. And they vehemently oppose any reforms to keep them in check by removing, by removing prosecutorial investigative power and establishing independent oversight. And this is Yoon's words. He's referring to critics as communist anti-state forces. He says, South Korea's freedom is under constant threat from communist totalitarian and anti-state forces who are critical of South Korea's deepening ties with the US and Japan. So in other words, he said, democracy activists, you and I, right? you and I, human rights advocates, you and I, progressive activists, you and I, we are apparently, according to him, engaging in despicable, unethical, I didn't come, it, this is his word, despicable, unethical tactics and false propaganda. We must never succumb to the forces of communist totalitarianism. So here's some of data about how under Yun Seung Yeol, those people who were indicted for the violation of Korea's uh, national security law, national security law, arresting, censoring, so you may wonder, so, so far I looked at the election, the basic facts of the election, and then I looked at the historical and geopolitical um, context of the election. And uh, um, that makes you wonder, how can the elections under such condition uh, be uh, legitimate? So how did the Korean people resist? Because I mentioned about Korean, the vigorous resistance, history, genealogy of resistance, struggle, fight for justice. Yes, Koreans have resisted. There has been protests. Now, I'll give, I'll show you some of the um, samples, examples. Right now, on, in the streets of Seoul, absolute unity for victory. Impeach you. This is just last week. Seventy-seventh candlelight vigil, candlelight protest. Seventy-seven every week. Fight the anti-worker government. Korean Confederation of Trade, Trade Union will win. South Korea declared war on unions. In other words, when you say uh, United States war against China, translate into Korean ordinary people, it means a war against their lives, working poor, working family, women and children. Right? It's a war on them. Believe it or not, again, this is not a typo. 20, 20 point, 21.5 hours per, per day worker, work week, work day. Protest erupt. Impeach Yoon and victory for workers, Korean Confederation of a Trade Union. Democrats and Progressive unites against Yoon. 
Unity for National Assembly elections to impeach Yoon. Yoon resign. Protest in candlelight visual protest, Frankfurt, Germany. Will protest until Yoon steps down. Weekly protest has been held in Los Angeles every week. And yet last week, 200 peace organizations in Korea and abroad, they all declared major peace declarations, stop us rk joint war games in front of Korea's National Assembly. What is not happening is this, you can see that there's some, the history of inter-Korean rapprochement. Now there's nothing here, right? As you can see, the last thing is stopped 2018 and nothing here. So this is where, um, in other words, United States, United States imperial um, hegemonic quest, the way that impact Korea is this. So domestic repression and the complete frozen, frozen, the winter in the Korean Peninsula, no rapprochement. And uh, you might wonder what this is about. This is just, uh, uh, this is a repression in 1980. Now we are back to 1980 under Yoon Sung Yeol. This a graduate of Korea's MIT, KAIST, who happened to uh, demand President Yoon's to stop, to restore funding that he cut for R&D and uh, security guard. Yoon's security guard is completely violently repressing him to show that the state of uh, uh, repression in Korea. That being said, Korea is a skilled democracy. So this is the election that April 10th election that I'm going to, uh, I was referring to will be held. And let's look at some of those, um, the specific um, campaigns and issues that's gonna shape the outcome of the election. Um, uh -huh. Simon, yeah. Um, yeah. Could you wrap up in, a, in five minutes or so? Okay, yeah, let me just, yeah, I, no, yeah, I can so do that. Let me just, okay, no worries. <laughs> Now, okay, so this is showing that uh, some of those uh, good, good news is that most of them are uh, sliced uh, visuals. So look at some of the, the way the uh, Western media uh, reports the Korean elections. So it's gonna be neck and neck race. These are the two uh, head uh, leader of both two parties. Uh, Lee Jae Myung is the Democratic Party. Han Dong is Yoon Do Protege. Uh, the, uh, Prosecutor, no surprise, uh, is leading the Conservative Party. And uh, there is a sort of a sense of a disarray, meaning that both parties are sort of in trouble. Um, and therefore, there's a lot of uh, a split from the uh, from the both parties. And and uh, let's look at some of the... And then in the meantime, Korean spy agency is uh, raising the fear that North Korea is going to use a provocation to impact South Korea elections um, as a part of the uh, raising attention, uh, tension. In the meantime, there's another variable, and probably some of you might have followed. The Korea's uh, first, Yoon uh, seung uh, wife is, many refer to her as the more important, more powerful, than the president himself, and so it's called first lady problem, right? So probably will, you can look at the uh, news and the probably you'll see all the details. Anyway, so some of this, it's the, the, this election is going to be about change this uh, uh, image. As you can see this one, you will see that the green, blue is Democrat, super majority. The red conservative is the minor party. This, what's going to happen, the question is what's going to happen to this. Most likely it's going to be probably more um, close race, right? That's what we're going to get. The reason why it had last landslide election was because of during pandemic under present one. Okay, so let me, I can go to uh, some of the slides and it will be awesome to look at all this slide. But anyway, some of these uh, slides looking at the, the Korean is looking at the border, voters uh, survey. Uh, blue means again Democrats, red means conservative. Uh, thus far, there is more uh, more support for the uh, opposition parties. They thought that opposition party should win to uh, punish the ruling uh, conservative party. But it's becoming, as election goes closer, it's becoming uh, more closer. The most important thing is though, the one that's going to determine is the uh, undecided, about 20, 30% undecided. 
So that's going to be uh, interesting. And also there's going new party forming. For instance, this uh, Zhou Guk, who is the uh, Minister of uh, um, Justice, who served the President Moon. Uh, many thought he's gonna who who he was going to run uh, succeed President Moon, but because he led such big fight for the prosecution reform, he was completely uh, sabotaged. And anyway, so he formed a new party. So we'll see how his party is going to um, affect the outcome. Most important, though, for me, because I wrote I wrote my PhD uh, dissertation on the left party, right, and. Uh, there's no viable left party right now in Korea. This shows the interesting, the most important, most important left party was Nine True Labour Party, which was the third largest party at the time emerged. And uh, as you can see the history, it's completely uh, uh, become now a minor party. There's no viable left party in South Korea, in part specifically because the one that I mentioned, repression. In fact, UPP, United uh, Party, was completely uh, dis uh, dissolved by the uh, US South Korea Supreme Court. And that shows that, again, going, this is, I'm self-promoting, <laughs> this is a dissertation that I wrote when I when I uh, researched about the rise of the uh, the first uh, major left party, Korean Democratic Labour Party, which became which hold the thirteen percent and third largest party, and uh, uh, but it can later dissolved. Now, so let me uh, because we had only uh, you said only five minutes. Now I'm gonna uh, pause here and. Uh, um, to conclude, I did have uh, some of those slides looking at the more about the um, uh, how the U.S. how the, the current elections is being shaped by the uh, geopolitical context and also the uh, a new um, challenges. So, in conclude, to conclude, um, I want us to think about the um, critical examine the kind of uh, uh, peace movement that we have been um, doing. Uh, also critically evaluate, you know, what will be in view of this geopolitical and historical context, what will be the more uh, viable peace movement approach uh, um, as, as, a, as a part of our also um, forming alliance and solidarity with those Koreans in Korea right now who is uh, trying to come up with a, a more alternative approach to effectively contest this uh, the most important uh, geopolitical context that shaped the Korean Peninsula. Okay, let me pa let me pause here, and uh, I will uh, I will wait for a few questions. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Thank you so much for sharing such a comprehensive and in-depth knowledge about the role um, U.S. new Cold War policies have been playing in the current crisis um, around the Korean Peninsula. Um, in particular, uh, in relation to the current UN administration's um, autocratic uh, policies in South Korea. Uh, and uh, all the details about South Korean history and election prospects, uh, it's been so, um, so knowledgeable and so helpful. Um, now, Hayden Smith, uh, our New England Korea Peace Campaign member and a peace activist based in New Hampshire will facilitate Q&A session for about 10, 10 minutes. Sounds good. Um, thank you, Sunghee. And thank you, Professor Chun. It was uh, an enlightening lecture, as always. Um, as um, before we dive into Q&A, I just wanted to um, ask audience members, if you have any questions, please feel free to enter, enter them into the chat and I'll read them off for you. Um, if you're unable to use the chat, feel free to raise your hand and I'll, um, but if you're not able to use the chat. Um, I also just wanted to briefly spotlight Korea Peace Advocacy Week, which will be coming up in March. Um, we have responsibility here in the US to also um, put pressure on our lawmakers to stop these US-led initiatives like the war games that Professor Chun mentioned. Um, I'll put a registration link here in the chat, but uh, without further ado, let us move on to questions. Um, 
I do see um, from Cole, uh, the first question in the chat, um, North Korea says they have given up on the goal of reunification. What's your analysis of their position? I think this was uh, um, <clears throat> my reaction. It, I think there are uh, Koreans in uh, in Korea, uh, leftists and also pro-unification peace activists are still trying to um, kind of uh, understand North Korea's uh, new uh, policy. And uh, we, in my view, there is not yet, there's not been any consensus. I think one point is this: uh, North Korea's this is a tactic. You, you, uh, North Korea is specifically against um, South, you, the kind of unification uh, by led by United States, led by South Korea, that absorbing North Korea militarily. I think North Korea is opposing that type of unification. Uh, some are some look at that German unification was just like that. Uh, East Germany completely uh, capitulated. Uh, Soviet Union collapsed, was collapsing, gave up, gave up. And North Korea uh, does not want to have anything with that kind of unification. And the second is that uh, North Korea is, if you look at it, the right now is a little, a little bit more strengthened, in strength, stronger position than previously, even under Trump administration. North Korea is uh, closer with uh, alliance with uh, um, China and Russia. A rising China and Russia is also in you know, some stronger land. And uh, uh, North Korea wants to have a longer perspective. North Korea already has the North Korea is a uh, de facto nuclear weapon state. United, United States would not be able to preemptively attack North Korea without risking nuclear war in the Korean Peninsula. So North Korea has that uh, deterrence. It has taken, obviously, that's why they, you know, why if you take North Korea's point of view, that's why they have uh, developed nuclear weapons to uh, deter United States uh, attack. If you look at the Kim Jong-un's uh, speech, you know, actually, two thirds of his speech, most of Paul's speech, he's actually focusing on the development, economic development, right? Regional development. So in other words, I think North Korea is really number one priority right now is to, uh, to on the uh, development. I think that Greg Illich uh, all bad, um, did a very good job of analyzing that. So that's what I think. Um, going back to a South Korean uh, peace activist point. Let's focus more on the um, the on the without analyzing without fighting U.S. imperial um, penetration in South Korea, you cannot really go one step to peace. So that's where I think that we are in a way also making shift. So um, I, I don't think that. So my 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 quick answer to uh, your North Korea is. Seeming shift and change in unification is is that North Korea does not does not want any uh, forcible uni reunification led by South Korea and United States. Understood. Um, thank you for answering that, and I I agree with that in interpretation. Um, I'll go over to the next question from Mike uh, Bulstein. Um, is there political representation in Korea to express public dissatisfaction with USA dominance of Korea's military and foreign policy? Could you, I think there was a, there was a, a connection was lost. Could you repeat the question again? Sure thing. Um, is there political representation in Korea to express public dissatisfaction with USA dominance of Korea's military and foreign policy? As I said, um, because of there is um, there's lack of um, viable left progressive party 
that can um, have a meaningful impact on policies regarding uh, U.S. Uh, imperialism in South Korea? I think my answer, unfortunately, is, is no. Um, and also the condition, again, I, I, the main point of my talk is that it's, a, it's almost becoming impossible right now under Yoon suk yeol administration. Uh, under uh, Moon Jae-in, President Moon Jae-in, we had a very different environment. Um, so, you know, we can talk about that later, interesting, with that itself interesting. But at this point, we do not have, that is the main problem. Uh, the, the the Cold War and the new Cold War is a fundamentally shaping the political ideological space in which in South Korea, where South Korean citizens, South Korean non-government organization, peace organization are operating. Very, very limited. Now, just last week, there is a um, 50-year-old peace activist, you know, people who have, who have uh, worked for unification, uh, who criticized the South Korea's uh, importing F-35 were sentenced to 10 years just last week. Right? For what? For violating national security laws. Imagine. So I'm just giving you one. And there is uh, uh, right now, the last year, I think when we did the last, uh, remember what, last webinar, the reason why I had the last webinar was because of this um, uh, mother of two children who were arrested for simply working for a Korean unification. Right. And uh, they, they, they indicted her, they, uh, they interrogated her without even attorney's uh, uh, presence, and she's not being on trial, again, for violating national security. In other words, my short answer to your question is really, it's almost impossible, unless you want to be, you know, uh, arrested and indicted. I really appreciate that answer and that it's, it's um, alarming, but really appreciate your your honest, very candid response there. Um, I have another question from uh, Kumju, I believe, um, asking, sorry, I just lost it in the chat. Um, what it's, since it's an election year here in the United States as well, although ours are a bit later, what do you think about the impact on the peace in the Korean peninsula um, on peace in the Korean Peninsula, depending on the outcome of the U.S. presidential election, that is, if Trump or Biden is elected, respectively. That's a good question. So all of your questions are amazing. We have a good um, audience. <laughs> yeah, you guys are just amazing. Um, uh, I make me miss Boston again. Um, the my answer is there aren't going to be any much, uh, I don't think it's going to impact much regardless who become president. And because as you know, the uh, US foreign policy right now currently shaped by this, uh, really the anti-China war in China uh, hawk group, regardless who's going to be, they are the, in the power, they are in the, 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 the deep state, they are the driving force. That being said though, um, and also if Biden get reelected, he will just continue to do what he has been doing. In fact, I might be Biden is the worst president, U.S. president, when it comes to Korean, Korean Peninsula. He has done work, really, truly one of the worst. He has done nothing, and he's only been escalating by forging the, the, the uh, hawkish uh, Japan-Korea-U.S. alliance and uh, basically doing nothing. Um, tr if Trump get elected, though, I'm going to say, you know, Trump get elected, I think the my, gets my sense that, you know, because she just, Probably he will try to undo everything that Biden does because he doesn't like Biden so much. That's my guess. And that include that uh, um, he will try to, you know, trunk his style, right? And the ego driven and all that. But uh, but still, I think uh, there's a good chance that I think that he will try to uh, try to rapprochement another summit or, or with the North Korea. And in fact, in this case, uh, Trump will be, Trump will be in a better position because he does he no longer has this Russia issue that he had. Uh, last presidency and also uh, Kim Jong in North Korea will be also you know, in a you know, stronger position. And so they may try to do, uh, I think that I, I, I can see that, see, foresee that Trump try to, will be a little bit different. But if Biden get reelected, I don't see any change. Um, and, uh, uh, but still the bottom line is that I don't see any major change in the Korean Peninsula. That means United States has no interest whatsoever in peace in Korea. Regardless who's 
which political party in the United States. That I'm, I'm, I feel pretty sure. Therefore, I think the people who can really make a difference is the only people who can do something about it. In fact, actually Koreans themselves. Um, so that is where in the, the talk that I, slide that I prepared, I didn't get to show was that I think it, it's about, this is not about nuclear weapons issue. It's not about North Korean nuclear. It is a lack of Korea, Korea's history of fighting for independence. We have fought from independent from Japan and this is time. Independence is more, the restoring sovereignty is the most important as far as to me for, for, for Koreans. Nobody's gonna give that to them. They have to, we have to fight for it. Anyway, that's it. Thank you for that. Um, I guess with, with so many elections going on around the world this year, it's, and, uh, the ways that the, the domino effects and the way that will impact each other. It's um, certainly a, a heady time. Um, I wanted to ask an, our next question. Um, let me check who's next in the queue. Um, um, Natalia uh, asked, what do you think about family and cultural, uh, a focus on family and cultural ties instead of um, a divorce from the U.S. focus. Um, Natalia, I, um, if you could um, perhaps elaborate on your question a little bit. Well, it wasn't meant as a question. It was meant that I'm pretty sure that people in Korea have families that were separated by the artificial border created. And rather than making policy focusing on sovereignty and objecting the cover from the United States, which may not really give you so much traction at this point, it would be difficult, I would think, to argue against wanting to have more family connection regardless of ideology or anything else. Uh, basically reframing the struggle for sovereignty and independence may yield results. Does that make sense, I hope? I, I think that if I can respond, I think that's a really excellent point. I think that that's something that, you know, if you ask me that, what I feel in my heart, right? But as a political scientist, I'm, I'm trained as a political scientist. It's about... We can't hear you. Interstate relations. Um... Simon, your connection is in and out, fortunately. Oh. Give it another 20 seconds to connect. Hayden, Hayden are you sure I can't answer my question? We are running a little bit low on time. Um, Perhaps we can ask uh, Professor Chun to um, provide her contacts and we can send that to attendees uh, later so you can ask your question then. I do apologize. We ended up getting a lot of questions. That and also I put in the chat for all three of you. Okay. Um, Hayden, perhaps we should wrap up. Sure. Okay. Let's do that. Um, so I did want to, um, okay. even though we've, lost the connection professor chan um yeah 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 so, oh yes oh I, I, are we connected again yes connected okay so what i said was i think the one that uh, that really touched my heart is that when the, what, what pope francis said he said that uh, you know koreans you guys speak the same language and i said what that means is that you guys share same parents mother and father you know and uh, what that means that the korean what, what koreans share are deeper than any ideology, any political ideas, any, I talked about, you know, all these different 
uh, liberalism, progressive America, it's deeper than anything, right? That to me is very, uh, that, that's, that's a treasure. I think we have to be able, we should be able to um, remember that. So in that sense, I think that your, your, um, your, um, the question is a very good one. But that being said though, we have to address the reality, right? As international as, uh, political scientists, we have to look at the, the, the macro picture structure of world barriers that stops, that, are, that hinder. I'm glad we could squeeze that in. Um, thank you so much, Professor Chun. Um, I'll turn it back over to Cindy. Okay, for um, sharing, uh, personally facilitating our two short cues, sharing your enthusiastic interest in the peace and the Korean Peninsula. We will uh, uh, send uh, the what's in the chat box to Dr. Chun and get her answers uh, as much as possible. Um, now the action plan before you leave with tensions on the Korean Peninsula running dangerously high, it's, it, it, we really need to act. And um, luckily we have a planned Korea Peace Advocacy Week uh, scheduled March 18th through 22nd, organized by Women Cross DMZ and its nationwide grassroots affiliates like the New England Korea Peace Campaign. In this annual event, we'll educate members of the Congress about the urgent nature